planet Earth hangs in a precarious balance. From the vast atmospheric and environmental forces that leave no part of the planet untouched, to the multitudinous ecosystems that each form a puzzle piece of a greater whole, to every biological being, everything that colors the human experience from morality to religion, from heritage to culture, the feeling of oneness with your terrestrial home, and everything that you would do to protect yourself, your people, and humanity itself. The natural existence of all of these things places them in the middle of two extremes, and any little intrusion from an outside force could in a split second push them in one direction or the other. Where is the tipping point between keeping our atmosphere and environment healthy and pumping just enough pollution to trigger feedback loops across the planet that'll push us towards worldwide devastation. On the flip side, where is the tipping point between advocating for human rights and pro-environmental causes and fighting for the betterment of people and the planets and feeling as if genocide or other extreme measures are the only things that will save us from potential extinction? Whether we want to admit it or not, what most of us would see as two distinct sides to these existential and moral challenges actually exist within a hair's breadth of one another. And all it can say to send you careening from one side to the other is the twitch of a pendulum that typically keeps all things in balance. Climate change is a very real, very looming threat that is already affecting nearly every corner of the globe, causing massive wildfires across the whole of Australia, killing coral reefs and aquatic life at breathtaking speeds, the melting of permafrost in Siberia that's sending gigatons of methane, a greenhouse gas that's nearly 30 times more potent than CO2 into the atmosphere, the steady breakdown of typical weather patterns, and the webbing that holds all of these ecosystems together. And the flames are now licking at our toes, inducing a deep-seated panic and realization that we sit right now at perhaps the most dangerous tipping point in all of human history, and that drastic action must be taken as quickly as possible before our story is abruptly forced to come to a close. But what should this drastic action look like? Because of our desperate circumstances, are we justified in bending moral principles and making sacrifices for a greater good, saying that humanity must pay the price? Or should we reaffirm the importance of all human life while reforming or dismantling any system responsible for pushing us to this point in the first place? Over the past few years, we have seen two distinct movements rise in prominence and take different sides in how they believe they should face the climate crisis. Extinction Rebellion, a now global, organized, but decentralized environmental movement founded in the UK by Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook, as well as activists from the group Rising Up, states that their primary mission is to use mass civil disobedience to fight for immediate action on climate change before we witness a full sociological and ecological collapse. And on the other side of the coin, there is a disorganized but growing movement of people whose ideology is deeply rooted in something more sinister, fascism and white supremacy, and the idea that genocide is a perfectly acceptable solution to cleansing the earth and preserving their heritage. They call themselves eco-fascists. On the surface level, these two movements couldn't seem more disparate in their goals and how they seek to achieve them, but there are common threads that tie the two together, and it's important to both acknowledge what those threads are and where we should draw the line between advocacy that reinforces the best qualities in humankind and the advocacy that reinforces the absolute worst in humankind. Let's start by examining Extinction Rebellion, their mission statements and principles, and how they've put those principles into action. On their website, Extinction Rebellion states their three primary goals that they believe will kickstart the movement towards climate justice. One, the government must tell the truth by declaring a climate and ecological emergency, working with other institutions to communicate the urgency for change. Two, the government must act now to halt biodiversity loss and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. And three, 
the government must create and be led by the decisions of a citizen's assembly on climate and ecological justice. And when the reach of Extinction Rebellion's activism reached the U.S., they added one final demand that I consider the most important. We demand a just transition that prioritizes the most vulnerable people and indigenous sovereignty, establishes reparations and remediation led by and for black people, indigenous people, people of color, and poor communities for years of environmental injustice, establishes legal rights for ecosystems to thrive and regenerate in perpetuity, and repairs the effects of ongoing ecocide to prevent the extinction of human and all species in order to maintain a livable, just planet for all. You could say that they want to build class solidarity and awaken class consciousness in order to energize and anger the people into at last holding those in power accountable for all the ways in which power has been stolen from both marginalized communities and the public at large and smash every single barrier in order to put maximum political pressure on institutions of power until they either yield or are crushed. I wonder what Marx would have thought of the movements. <laughs> Speaking of Marx and leftist philosophies, something that caught my attention while reading about the structure of Extinction Rebellion and their overall vision for the movement were statements that almost sounded anarchist in nature, which naturally I appreciated. For example, humiliated by poverty and inequality, crushed by debt, powerless, controlled, and trapped. Many feel defrauded of what should rightly be theirs. Society are polarized, people estranged from each other and sundered from the living world. Humans are by nature cooperative. Did anyone else think of mutual aid when you heard that last quote? They believe in breaking down hierarchies of power for more equitable participation and seek to organize in small autonomous groups distributed around the world, connected in a complex web that is constantly evolving as we grow and learn. Participation is voluntary and activists are allowed to hold their own individual protests bearing the XR name and logo so long as they adhere to their values, which truly makes it unique and well adapted for a world in which, because of social media, recognition of a brands or image is everything. But not only that, it's a true people's movement built on the unification of every single class and community of humankind, one that has resulted in some of the biggest marches in all of history and awakened the world at large to the true severity and urgency of the modern climate crisis. Millions now understand the necessity of fighting to preserve the planet and nature for generations to come and ensuring that it's built for all people, regardless of race, identity, gender, etc. That's a bit of a rough summary on their overall philosophy, but how does their philosophy inform their activism? Upon its founding in 2018, XR took inspiration from grassroots movements of the past, such as Occupy, Gandhi's Satyagraha, the suffragettes, the fight for civil rights, as well as protests by indigenous peoples, and they set out to commit acts of mass civil disobedience. Starting with an assembly of over 1,000 people in London's Parliament Square that blocked off the road, leading to the Houses of Parliament. These protests are meant to bring public awareness to the inaction of governments across the world towards enacting any meaningful legislation that would potentially keep global temperatures from rising any higher than two degrees Celsius, which would cause catastrophic devastation and destabilization. And XR routinely highlights reports from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that say we now only have a decade left to enact massive systematic reform before we're no longer able to mitigate the catastrophes that are currently barreling towards us. In other words, everyone needs to wake up immediately and understand that all life on Earth now faces one singular threat. The sixth mass extinction, which could be the final one if nothing is done. It's a terrifying thing to accept, let alone comprehend because of the scale of this crisis. But XR actively works with climate scientists to educate the public on what's at stake 
if no action is taken. For example, studies have shown that the current rate of extinction of species is estimated at 100 to 1,000 times higher than natural background rates, and that the sixth mass extinction continues into the 21st century, with meat consumption, overfishing, and ocean acidification, and the decline in amphibian populations accelerating the breakdown of diversity, with roughly 1 million species of plants and animals facing extinction within decades as the result of human actions. Once the food chains and ecosystems necessary for sustaining life are wiped out, mass die-offs will occur in every single level of land and sea, and humanity itself would likely experience millions upon billions of deaths due to agriculture, food production, and necessary resources becoming wholly unsustainable. And even if they don't outright say it, it's clear that the global catastrophes soon to come, as well as those already already happening all shared their roots with one central source. Unfettered capitalism and wealthy overlords who see no problem in quite literally killing the earth so long as the dollar bills keep flowing. Keeping this in mind, however, when a supposed XR Twitter account posted a sign that said, Corona is the cure, humans are the disease, I was immediately suspicious because that statement implies that we are a plague or parasite and that planet Earth would be better off without us. With what you now know about XR's ideals and how they target the system rather than simply people, it should be fairly obvious that something fishy was going on. And sure enough, the UK branch of Extinction Rebellion said in a tweet that information with messaging that is not in line with what XR believes or stands for was being shared by far-right adversaries. So, far-right adversaries were responsible for attempting to smear XR and kneecap their movement. To what end? Was it merely out of spite, or was there an underlying motive? Regardless, the statement contains echoes of eugenics as well as the ideology of eco-fascism, which has roots stretching all the way back to the days of Nazism and the Reich Nature Protection Law of 1935, we'd be better served examining what eco-fascism is, how it shares many of its beliefs with the alt-right, and how it connects to traditionally left-leaning environmental movements. Sarah Manavis of the British magazine The New Statesman wrote a fantastic article, which I'll link below, that thoroughly explains the ideologies ins and outs. In it, she interviews an avowed eco-fascist who wished to remain anonymous, and when asked to describe his principles, he said, Eco-fascists have put the well-being of our Earth, nature, and animals on the forefront of their ideology, and it's someone who has also turned away from industrial and urbanized society, seeking a more close-to-the-earth way of life. They see the land and the people as an organic whole. Whereas XR criticizes modern industrialization and capitalism because of the immense environmental devastation caused by both, but seeks to harness the power of green energy and reform the energy sector in the process, Eco-fascists seek to do away with every bit of it and return to a more agrarian society that would more resemble rural farmlands than concrete jungles like New York City. Sarah continues to describe it as an ideology that embraces and combines modern-day neo-Nazism with environmentalism, and a belief that going back to ancient geographical roots is the answer to society's biggest problems. Eco-fascists believe that living in the original regions a race is meant to have originated in, and shunning multiculturalism is the only way to save the planet they prioritize above all else. I'm sure we've all seen the videos of racists yelling, go back to where you came from, to anyone who looks vaguely non-white. There's a good chance that a few of them may have been eco-fascists due to their belief that non-white immigrants are literally polluting their ancestral homelands. Alt-writers and eco-fascists both believe that a rejection of multiculturalism honors their forefathers, which serves as a dog whistle for whiteness, remember that, but eco-fascists go a bit further by saying that the very existence of multiculturalism, or the presence of a few too many brown people in their lands, will literally lead to the destruction of the planet. They believe it's a form of national suicide to allow people from cultures that disrespect animals, the lands, etc., to step foot into what they believe is their country. I can only imagine how indigenous peoples would feel about those beliefs. 
<laughs> because of its roots in Nazism, eco-fascists see genocide as the only way to purify the lands and take inspiration from Richard Walter Dar, a Nazi ideologue from Hitler's time, who invented the term blood and soil, which described Germany's ideal of a racially defined national body, blood, unified with a settlement area soil. As such, there are two concepts that underpin the whole of the eco-fascist ideology and more fully separate them from white nationalists. The Malthusian catastrophe, which occurs when population growth outpaces agricultural production, and the closely related concept of overpopulation, or when the relationship between the human population and resources on planet Earth reaches a breaking point. You begin to tread on a bit of a moral minefield, though, when you posit exactly how you go about balancing the viability of life with the stability of resources. XR and people like myself want to preserve life without sacrificing it, whereas eco-fascists believe in the idea of deep ecology, or a drastic and often forceful culling of the population and specific races within that population as the only way to ensure that the population survives. In my opinion, instead of asking ourselves if there are too many people on Earth, maybe we should look at the systems used to create and distribute goods, food, etc., and ask ourselves if we're being environmentally responsible, if we're being efficient, and only doing that which serves the greater good while minimizing as much harm as possible. If the systems themselves are corrupt and dysfunctional, why would we look at other human beings as the true source of this issue rather than the systems, especially if we know we could sustain our population with something more efficient? Perhaps we should be looking at mass overconsumption waste, consumer culture, and other areas as root causes of hunger, environmental destruction, limited resources. But this is a moral argument I'm making. Eco-fascists have bent the moral principles that we take for granted to justify the killing of those who don't look like them, i.e. whites. And I hope to the gods that this never happens, but if they were to ever take control of a government somewhere in the world, it's almost guaranteed that we would see a genocide on the level of the Holocaust, if not worse. And we're already seeing a disturbing trend of people willing to take things into their own hands and commit horrific acts of violence that they see as heroic and necessary. The Christchurch shooter, who I'm choosing not to refer to by name, carried out the deadliest mass shooting in New Zealand's history, leaving 51 dead after attacking two mosques. Before doing so, though, he'd written a manifesto which I will summarize but not directly quote from, in which he described himself as an eco-fascist and said he wanted to ensure the existence of our people and a future for white children. In other words, the white genocide conspiracy theory that has become more commonplace in the conservative of ideology. He also denies having any personal hatred for Muslims living in their homelands, but denounces Muslims choosing to invade our lands, live on our soil, and replace our people. And this idea directly connects to alt-riders and Trump painting immigrants as a disease and a dangerous other that threatens their traditions and safety. Ecofascists wouldn't even consider allowing immigrants to assimilate. They want their ethnostate to be become a reality, regardless of how many would die in the process. The shooter even went as far as acknowledging climate change, but claims that it was the fault of overpopulation by non-white Europeans and, remember deep ecology? He genuinely believed that his actions would help save the environment. Unfortunately though, he wasn't the first of his kind. In August of 2019, a 21-year-old in El Paso, Texas, killed 22 in a mass shooting and declared declared in a manifesto that he posted on the website 8chan that he was attempting to stop a Hispanic invasion of Texas. I grew up in East Texas and can't even begin to count the number of times I heard a statement like that. He believed that immigration was environmental warfare and said there is no nationalism without environmentalism. Much like Extinction Rebellion, he believed that the destruction of the environment will make it more difficult for future generations to sustain themselves and that corporations bear the lion's share of responsibility due to their exploitation of resources. Where he diverged wildly from XR, though, was his belief that ridding Earth of enough people was the only solution. It's here that we see just how closely environmentalism and eco-fascism can sometimes be aligned with one another, with the 
shooter dismayed over pollution from farming and oil drilling, the massive waste that has resulted from rampant consumerism, the ways in which urban sprawl destroys nature and centuries-old habitats, the burning down of rainforests, and the unwillingness of many Americans to change their lifestyle, despite the fact that this all is accelerating the breakdown of the environment. And it makes my skin crawl reading his words and agreeing with almost everything he says up until he mentions genocide. The fact that I unknowingly wandered so close to thinking like him when I wasn't cognizant of all the atrocities connected to the idea of overpopulation, I think it just shows how easy it can be to fall into belief systems like this, to justify committing or supporting atrocities because it's seen as a necessary sacrifice for the greater good. And this is where the line between advocacy that reinforces the best qualities in humankind and advocacy that reinforces the worst in people is crucial. Crossed, and where people are radicalized in the absolute worst way possible, turned into a martyr for a cause that will only serve to destroy the moral fabric of our species, rather than something that will unify us in fighting for a world that will serve every one of us equally and instill in us the necessity of protecting all biological life. When it comes to facing an environmental crisis that is going to affect every single one of us at one point or another and lead to some of the most horrific diseases disasters and climate migrations the eyes of history have ever seen. We must bring ourselves closer together and understand that anything, any little spark of something that would cause us to see other human beings as the virus instead of capitalism and every other systemic force that led us to this point must be done away with. How effective movements like Extinction Rebellion have been at affecting true systemic change I think is a discussion for another time, but the type of activism they embody, mass protests of everyday people putting massive political pressure on their governments and making it known that nothing will make them back down because everything is on the line is something I think is not only necessary and desperately needed, but something we need to see more and more of. We also need to be wary of the infiltration of eco fascist ideals into these movements and be aware of any group or cause that would seek to kneecap us, whether directly or through propaganda from the media, YouTube, 8chan, or any other platform in which users would be more susceptible to misinformation and negative radicalization. Extinction Rebellion is not an eco-fascist organization. They've made that well known and even though I have minor disagreements with some of their tactics, overall I'm more than happy to support them and had an absolute blast joining them during last year's climate march here in Portland to bring everything to a close and give my final thoughts. Environmentalism is intrinsically tied to civil rights, to our consumption habits, to how we affect the world and how it affects us, to how we see one another and how we see all the forces at play that either aid or harm us. Every action we take will at one point or another pluck one part of the vast intricate web that is planet Earth. We should only do that which benefits the whole of humanity. No. And in a way, it does require going back to an older way of thinking. In an article for Daedalus, Jack D. Forbes said, indigenous peoples in the Americas believe in the conception of creation as a living process, which results in a living universe in which a kinship exists between all things, making Mother Earth a living being as well as the waters below and the sun above. In the book Lame Deer, Seeker of Visions, a Lakota medicine man known as Lame Deer said that humanity will only be preserved if all of us, Indians and non-Indians alike, can again see ourselves as part of the earth, not as an enemy from the outside who tries to impose its will on us. Because we also know that being a living part of the earth, we cannot harm any part of her without hurting ourselves. In the eyes of the universe, we are all insignificant, but in one another's eyes, we should all be equal and equally valued. This is all we have. There is no planet B. I stole that from our stoner rock gods, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. <laughs> no more passivity. No more acting like the white moderate of MLK's time. No more allowing privilege and intersecting systems of oppression to divide us. Regardless of who we are or where we come from, the worldwide threat of climate change is coming. It is coming quickly. And those who are already marginalized will be disproportionately affected in ways that we couldn't even begin to imagine. We need to fight for them. We need need to fight for each other, and we need to fight for survival because all of it, 
is on the line. Never forgets planet Earth, us, existence itself. All of it hangs forever in a precarious, beautiful balance. <laughs>